The creators of Joseph and his brothers bring you the sequel, Moses, the story of Moses. It's about Moses. You want to hear a joke? What's the worst part about being a slave? Oh, the hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. The pay could be better too. Oh, sandwich. Well, now that I have your attention, I just had a good conversation with Pharaoh. Pharaoh? You'll like this. Let me tell you how it went. Hey, Pharaoh, I got a joke for you. What's the worst part about being a Pharaoh? The hours. <laughs> now that I have your attention, I just had a good conversation with a burning bush. You'll like this. Let me tell you how it went. Hey, God. You want to know what the hardest part about being gone? No! Enough, Enough with, with the, the jokes, jokes, Moses. And yes, the answer is the hours. Anyway, I have a mission for you, Moses. You must go to the land of Egypt and tell Pharaoh to let my people go. <laughs> so there you have it, Pharaohs. You gotta let the purple grow. What Aaron's trying to say is, let the people go. I don't know. It's it's a bad time. The Egypt, the economy. Okay I, then. I guess you'll just have to deal with a bunch of plagues from God. Check this out. The plow. Whoa, a snake. Look, there are some locusts. Ah! Oh! oh my God! Oh, no. ah! Look, it's hailing. Yeah, I, I get to my job. I have to go to work. Ah, ah, hey, you, hey, you killed me. Look, the Nile's all bloody. Look, a bunch of frogs. Oh, this is my favorite thing. No. Yo. Oh. Boing, boing, boing. Oh no, Moses, I can't take it. All these plagues, the frogs, just get out, go. Okay, take your people, take all your stuff, take all your ribbity, hippity hoppity frogs, just take it all and get out of here, go. Just leave, now, leave, please leave. Okay, we'll leave and we're never coming back. You'll wish we will be, but we won't be. Well, if I ever change my mind, I'll come get you myself. Well, I wouldn't do that if I was you. Yay! Yay! Well, we tried so hard and got so far. But in the end, it didn't really matter because, well, there's the Red Sea. And now... We're stuck. Oh, look right behind us. Oh. Looks like Pharaoh's coming back for us after all. Oh, no. Oh. Calm oh, down, geez. everyone. It'll be okay. You don't need to worry. Does anybody happen to have a boat? Anyone at all? <laughs> okay, God. We don't have a boat, but you gave me this stick. Hey, Red Sea, I got a joke for ya. What do you have in common with a banana? You're both split! Uh-oh, I hear cheering! Who's laughing now? And I turn to the other guy and I says that you know it's the hours. <laughs> All right, guys, we did it. The Egyptians and Pharaoh, they're vanquished. We're on this side now. We're free. We're free. We're finally free. We're free. <laughs> And so concludes Moses, the story of Moses. What's up, Crossley Church? How are you?
Okay, so uh, that was from the mind of our wonderful Pastor Ted again. Yeah. Give it up for Pastor Ted. We've been in a series talking about Exodus. We've been talking about the Red, like, like the story up to the Red Sea. This weekend, we're actually talking about the Red Sea. But I, I just have to ask this question. Was the worship good this weekend so far? Yeah. Okay, Zimmerman, Big Lake, Elk River, if you're happy to be in the house of God, make some noise. Seriously, so far, I already feel like, like I'm like, like, like really like, whoa, God is up to something. He's doing something in this place tonight. I'm feeling like, holy cow, what is going on? Look at the person next to you and say, God has something really special for you tonight. Big Lake, Zimmerman. As you guys approach this talk at your campuses, I want you to know that God has a, a, a big deal conversation for you to have this weekend. Because here's the, here's the reality with whatever campus we're at this weekend, whatever we we're talking about. Like the, the point of this whole series has been, what if you could live a heroic life? It seems like the average American lives less than heroic. We, 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 we tend to be, uh, like, there's a few of us that do, I mean, we, and we pay them, uh, police officers and firemen and, and the military, and we tend to, we pay people to be heroes, and the rest of us, we want to play the role of hero a little bit, we'd like to do something awesome, but we spend a lot of our time, a lot of our lives, just hoping to really relax. We're like, I'm going to work, I've come home, I just want to relax, man, I just need a little bit of time to myself, I just need a, a fo little focus on me, it'd be awesome if we could kick back, if I could, if I could have a beer, if I could, if I could just watch a movie, if we could just get away for a while, if I could just chill out, my life would be better. It seems like the purpose of a lot of Americans' lives is hedonism. We've been talking about this the last couple, ever say hedonism. hedonism. What we mean by hedonism is self-centered or self focused living. Now, you know what? I hope you get a great lazy boy. I hope you get an awesome car and you get, to, you, you get the great TV and you get to go to the movies and I hope you get an awesome vacation. I hope you get all of this. But if the purpose of our lives is to sit around and wait for something awesome to occur or watch somebody else do awesome, awesome things, doesn't that make our lives a little pathetic? It really does. See, I think God designed you to do something heroic. I think he was thinking when I created you, that, or when he created you, that he had more for you than sitting in a chair or going on vacation or having a new car or making sure you get the, the promotion. I think he actually thought, I think this person could make a difference in the world, but they're gonna have to deny themselves the chair a little bit and get up in order to do something heroic. For example, if you wanna do something heroic towards your wife, don't you have to get up out of the seat? She said, yes, she knows, <laughs> right? And like, like guys in here, you cannot live a heroic life towards your, towards your wife and stay in the chair. Honey, beer me. Can you live a heroic life like that? Yes or no? But it seems like this is the point of a lot of guys' lives. And it's sad, you were created for so much more. God had a future and a destiny and a purpose. He had something for you to accomplish, some mission for you to go on, something, for, something that would cause your life to thrive as you got up out of the seat and did something. Same is true for your kids. Is it, it is impossible to live heroic towards your children and stay in the chair. It is impossible to do something heroic towards your community and stay in the chair. It's like, hey, you know what? I'll just watch Netflix again. I know I could be heroic. And there's nothing wrong with Netflix. And there's nothing wrong with, with, with a great chair. And there's nothing wrong with a good car. And there's nothing wrong with vacation. But if we're not careful, what will happen is we will be lulled to sleep and we will spend our entire life. It reminds me of the Matrix and they're plugged in. And they're sitting there while they think they're living life, but instead of living life, they've done nothing ever. And the truth of the matter is, God wants you to have abundant life. He wants you to have a full life. But in order to see Christ's fulfillment, at some point, you're gonna have to get up from the chair. Are you with me? Yeah. So our goal with this is to reject hedonism and embrace heroism. Look at the person next to you and say, God calls you to a heroic life. Now that's gonna mean something different for every person in this room. And so here's what we wanna do in this last weekend of this series. This is what we're gonna do. Zimmerman, Big Lake, Elk River. Here's what we're doing for the very last part of this, because this is the last part of the story. This is the Red Sea story. Uh, I just wanna talk to you about how your, your life could be heroic every day from now till you die. How do you end up with a lifestyle of heroism versus a lifestyle of laziness? 
And I'm not calling you lazy. I want you to understand, we're not calling you lazy. I understand you all work hard. You, like, you're, you're after stuff. You're trying to accomplish things. But we're so exhausted from all we are trying to do that the rest of our lives get spent like r- literally zoning out. But what if you could find the one thing that God had in mind for your life? The one focus that he was after, the one thought process that he was gonna like, bam, I really wanna see you accomplish this. Don't you think the world could be a better place? Yeah, think about Moses for a second. Dude had no life. He's 80 years of age. God shows up at a burning bush and suddenly the entire world changes because he finally found his mission and his purpose. And so what I wanna talk with you about one last time is how do I get up from this chair, stay up, and move towards heroism. You ready to get to work? Yes. Okay, I'd like you to open your Bible to Exodus chapter 14. Exodus chapter 14, that's on page 43. We're gonna only be in this one chapter of scripture. Well, this is the chapter about the story of the Red Sea. Um, and uh, as, we, as we look this, look at this up, I'm, I'd love for you to get some notes out, take some notes, but I'm just gonna pray. And then here's the thing, all I'm gonna give you tonight, this weekend, this, this is my thought process this weekend. My thought was, what if I just told you what I learned when I read the chapter? I was thinking about being a hero, trying to stay out of the chair, do something heroic for my spouse, do something heroic for my wife. What would that look like for me? And I just wrote some stuff down. And all I wanna do is I'm just gonna read through this and I'm gonna give you my observations on how I want to live a heroic life. And if it helps you, grab onto it, use it. Because God's got something more for you than the chair. You ready to go? Cool. I'm gonna pray and then we're gonna do it. Jesus, thank you for every life. Thank you for your grace, your goodness, your mercy, and your power. I pray that as we open up the word of God and study the things of God this weekend, I pray that people would hear your call, they would hear your voice, they would know your truth. That as we study your word, that we would hear your grace and your love and your power. May they experience grace. May you get goodness to them. But then may you empower them to get goodness through them to somebody else. God, we believe you, we trust you, we rest in you. We ask you to lead us now. In Jesus' name we pray, everybody said. Amen. Amen. So we're just gonna start by reading Exodus chapter 14, the first couple of verses. Here it goes, here's how it goes. Starts by saying this. Then the Lord gave these instructions to Moses. Order the Israelites to turn back and camp in Pi, between and the sea. Camp there along the shore, across from Baal, then, then Pharaoh will think the Israelites are confused. They are trapped in the wilderness. And once again, I will harden Pharaoh's heart and he will chase after you. I have planned this in order to display my glory uh, through Pharaoh and his whole army. After this, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites camped there as they were told. What just happened here? Up till now, this is what has kind of occurred. I'm gonna see if I can explain what just happened. So the, 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 like the Israelites leave Egypt. They're like, whoa, 10 plagues happened, we got out. And they're headed, they're headed for freedom. And so God's like, here's the path toward freedom, go get trapped. They didn't accidentally end up at the Red Sea. God told them to go get trapped again. I want you to be Moses. He's stoked, man. 10 plagues and plagues have happened. We're finally free. It's gonna be awesome. We're going to the promised land. Okay, how do I get there, God? Go get trapped again. What? See, Moses has spent 40 years in the desert. He knows exactly where he's headed. He knows God is trapping them at the edge of this body of water and the Egyptians are gonna chase after them. God told him himself. Why would God do this? Why would God free them only to let them get trapped again? You know why? It says it right in the passage. To display his glory. Come on, say that with me, to display his glory. glory. What does this mean for us as human beings? Like, I just want you to think this through for a second. Moses had to agree to this. Ever had uh, what you feel like, like God tell you something and you're like, man, that's way too hard, I'm not doing that. Come on, put your hands up if you ever thought that before. Like God, like you read something in the Bible, you're like, that is way too hard, there's no way I'm doing that. That's too difficult. That's too hard. I can't possibly, God. It's, I, you got to understand that Moses must have wrestled with this a little bit. I'm going to put my people at the edge of the Red Sea. They could all get killed. I'm not going there. I'm not doing that. But instead, the last verse there goes, so the Israel camped there as they were told. Here's how I tell you the first thing about heroes. First thing about heroes. Heroes embrace the hard stuff exactly as God directs. 
Heroes embrace hard stuff exactly as God directs. Here's what I want you to understand. There are two groups of people in here, those that are interested in something heroic and those that are interested in just being lazy. At the end of the life, you're like, hey, I gotta work a job, so I'll do it, but I really just wanna relax. And the truth of the matter is, anything hard is too much work. It's just, it's just like, oh, a better marriage. Oh, it's too much work to have a better marriage. It's too, like, it's, it's, too, it's too much work to have a better marriage. Like, oh, kick an addiction and actually stop drinking? So, ah, it's too much work. I can't, I can't possibly. Stop cursing out my wife? Oh, I can't possibly. It's just, it's, just too, it's just too hard, man. I can't possibly. I know there's stuff in here. Ah, it's just too much work. You'll never be heroic and say it's too much work. The reality is, in order for you to embrace all that God has requires you to do all that God calls you to do. Now, let's check it out. This is really important to catch. So God says, you know what? I want you to go do this thing. And, and, and God hear, Moses hears God's voice, so he goes and does it. What he doesn't do is go ask the people and say, what do you want me to do? I'll do what the, the hard things they want me to do. Sometimes your spouse will say, well, here's what you need to do. Or here's what your kids will be like, Dad, we really need to do this. Or, or your friends will be like, I know your problem. Here's your solution. And they tell you solution. Don't do what somebody else tells you to do. Do what he tells you to do. Right. And there's a big difference. There's a big difference. What was the last heroic thing God asked of you? What was the last thing God spoke? I was talking to a guy this week. And uh, we were talking, like, it was an hour-long conversation on the phone, and we were just talking about faith and life, and he's like, I don't think God's ever talked to me, ever. And I very humbly said this to him. I'm like, I'm not condemning you, I'm not upset with you, I'm not bothered by you, and like, like I want you to catch that there's no, like, I, I love you as my friend. He's like, okay, I get that. He goes, and I said, then you're not really a Jesus follower at all. Because if you have not heard the voice of God, you don't know God. You don't. I gave you this verse two weeks ago. I said, my sheep, Jesus said, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. So either you've heard the voice of God or not. And if you've never heard God's voice, you don't actually know him. You might be religious. You might attend a church, but you don't know Jesus. But you could. See, because the only thing that God's voice is saying to those who've never heard him is, hey, follow me. Follow me, follow me. He's been whispering this over your life, your, like, all of existence. And like, if you would just listen carefully, he's been like, hey, follow me, follow me. I could do something awesome with you. I could do something awesome with you. But you're never gonna fully hear him until you say, okay. Yeah. When you commit, suddenly the voice is heard until surrender happens. I never really heard God's voice. I never really got, no, knew for sure. Is this whole God getting real? Is this stuff true? Is this stuff true? Until I finally gave up the rights to my life. And I said, Jesus, I give you everything. I'll trust you. I'll follow you. I'll do whatever you ask of me. I trust you and you alone, Jesus Christ. Have you? Because if this has not occurred, then you have not actually made a real connection with God which is a scary thought because then you're gonna meet a stranger on judgment day. I meet a friend. I meet somebody who's gonna wrap me in his arms and go, hey, you did great. Well done. Come on in, it's gonna be awesome. Think of it like this. When you think about, uh, when you think about hard stuff, think about some of the hard stuff in scripture. I, I, I wrote down a couple things. Um, God says, commit, my, commit your entire life to me. What? That's way too hard, God. That's like being at the edge of the Red Sea. I don't know what's gonna happen next. You're right, that's the point. What do you mean? The miracle only happened because he was positioned for the miracle. Some of you are like, I want a miracle to happen, but I wanna be someplace else. God, I don't need to be at the edge of the Red Sea for the miracle to happen. I, I, I'll go over here someplace else. You park the Red Sea over there. And God's like, What? In order to see a miracle from God, you have to actually be positioned in a place to see the miracle. Commitment. How about baptism? Hey, hey, how about, how about you get baptized? How about you? You're like, that's scary, man. That's like a Red Sea moment. Yeah, for real, it's like being plunged under the water and surviving. <laughs> I can't possibly... The amount of people I have talked to who have gotten baptized and afterwards are like, I finally heard God's voice. It was like clear as day, like something occurred, something really spiritual happened that moment. How about, uh, 
How about uh, forgiving this person that's hurt you so bad? I can't possibly forgive them, God. You don't know what they did to me. You don't know how mean they were. You don't know how unkind they were. And God's like, hey, you position yourself in this place that you don't understand, that doesn't make any sense to you. You position yourself here, and then the miracle will happen. And when forgiveness occurs, all of a sudden, (laughs) waters part. Baptism happens and water part. A commitment to Christ, a real, legit, I follow you, Jesus. And suddenly, (laughs) paths are cleared and doors are opened. My my favorite one in this is tithing. Um, This is like when you give money to the church, for those of you who don't know what that is. Like, what what? what are you you smoking, God? I'd never do that. And like, that was my thought too. Um, So then um, uh, I give my life to Christ at 17 and we we start to do this whole deal. And uh, then we're married and uh, we have zero money. I made $1,600 a month total, uh, married with kids. That's what we made. Combined salary between the two of us, 1600 a month. Um, my, uh, for real, I'm not even making that up. That was, I mean, we were like, de- like it was scary. Um, our rent for our little two bedroom apartment uh, was 550 a month. Uh, and God was like, I-, I want you to trust me with your money. And I'm like, I can't trust you with my money. Like if, if I do that, like, I, like I, 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 that's, that's 160 bucks a month that I'll never, like, how, I can't even pay my bills now. And I remember looking at Kelly and said, we're gonna do it. And so we did. And it came the day that our, our, our rent was due. This is the, still, the story just blows me away. It's a Red Sea moment for my, for my family. It was like an epiphany moment for my life. I'm standing at the edge of the Red Sea. I can't pay my rent. I got nothing left. I'm like, well, I did what you asked me to do, God. And this buddy calls me, um, who I hadn't talked to in three years. He lived in Connecticut. I lived in Iowa. I lived in a little apartment in Waukee, Iowa. We haven't talked in three years. He calls and goes, hey, do you guys need money? I'm like, I haven't talked to you in three years. How, what? He goes, God told me to wire you 550 bucks today. Do you need money? Nice. On the day my rent is due, I about dropped the phone. I'm like, What? I'm like, yeah, I need money. I can't pay my rent. He's like, well, there's, like, it's already Western Union. I already wired it. It's over there. Just go pick it up. Awesome. And I walk down and I, I, I'm saying that I get the, the, the $550 like, money from Western Union and I'm walking into my, to, my, to, to, the, to, to the office to pay the rent. And I'm just like, this is, this is a freaking miracle. There's no other way to explain this except this person. And by the way, since then, we've talked like twice. God put my name on the, on the mind of an old friend so that when I walked in faith, he would say, if you'll step at the edge of the Red Sea, if you will position yourself for a miracle, a miracle can happen. But if you're not willing to step when God says step, you never see the miracle. But you could. You could. Here's here's my question. What hard thing have you been avoiding that God's been saying, oh, come on, just follow through. Just do it. Just follow through. Forgiveness and commitment and baptism and there's so many different things for so many different ones of you in this room but the reality is if you will position yourself for the miracle if you will trust if these are his words notice they're not not if there's somebody else's words not a pastor's words not a church's words not a friend's words if these are God's words he said step right here a miracle will follow because he's not gonna let his kids down. Heroes do the hard things God calls them to do. Come on, say, heroes do hard things. Remember, I'm preaching to myself. That's why we're doing another service next week. That's why we're adding a service in St. Cloud and we're probably adding a second service in St. Cloud. Uh, within, a, within a month or two, we're gonna switch the Big Lake campus when they move. They're moving from 3,600 square feet to 8,000 square feet. When they do, I'm gonna preach live in Big Lake also. I want you to understand that heroes do hard things. I'm gonna do hard things. I'm gonna be preaching my life away and it's okay, why? Because Jesus said so. This is where we're going. This is what I'm doing. This is, why? Because I wanna live a life that whenever he says position yourself, I'll be just fine. I'll be just fine. I'm taken care of, I'm blessed. You know that I've, like, that as, far as, as far as I know, I'm not very good with money, but as far as I'm not. But as far as I know, we have never been late on a mortgage payment or a, rental, a rent payment ever in our whole life. 
In situations like, like it's pretty easy to trust God after a, a, a Red Sea moment like that. Trust him. He loves you. He's, got a, he's never forgotten your need. He knows your story, but you have to be willing to get right up here on the edge if that's what he asks of you and say, okay, this is where you call me to stand. I will stand right here. Yes. Are you with me? Yes. We're not done yet. That was only the first point. I got six. Here we go. <laughs> Next verse. It says, when, when, when the word reached the king of Egypt that the Israelites had fled, Pharaoh and his officers changed their mind. What have we done letting all these Israelite slaves get away? They said, so Pharaoh harnessed his chariots and called up his troops and he took about 600 of Egypt's best chariots along with the rest of the, Egyptian, uh, the, the chariots of Egypt, each with their own commander. And the Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh and the king of Egypt. So he, what's the next word? Chased. He chased after the people of Israel who had left with their fist raised in defiance. The Egyptians, what's the next word? Chased. Authors repeat what's important. Two times it says, Egypt began to chase again those who were free. I, I need you to understand something from this. When you get free from something, whoa, I got free from this addiction. I got free from this struggle. I've moved past this issue. I want you to understand you're gonna get chased again because what enslaves you doesn't want to let you go. Right. Don't get cocky. Right. Don't get cocky. Number two, heroes know they will be chased. Heroes know they're gonna get chased. That, 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 that evil is gonna come against them again. It's gonna chase them down and try to stop them. But if you know that evil is gonna chase after you again, if you keep your guard up, if you're paying attention, you won't go back to old behavior. If you're going, yeah, you know what? I used to have this struggle and I used to have this issue and now I'm doing awesome so I can go hang out in the same old places I used to hang out and just be around those people and be around that scene and I'm not gonna go back to that because I'm free of that now. You are smoking something already. <laughs> right? Yeah. Because what has formerly enslaved you never wants to let you go. Right. Right. On the other hand, Jesus always has victory. Yes. Jesus always has victory. Woo! Jesus always has victory. Is this good news? Yes. This is why we worship Jesus. We follow Jesus because only Jesus is going to keep me free. Right. Here's how it goes next. This is, we're going to jump to verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the people of Israel looked up and panicked. They what? When they saw the Egyptians, what's the next word? Overtaking. Overtaking them. You would too, like, but just so you know, this is the superpower of the world. Uh, 600 chariots uh, decked out in iron with swords on the, on the spokes of the wheels are charging at them. It's like a, a tank division charging down on a defenseless group of people. They're peeing their pants. It's a pee your pants kind of moment. They cried out to the Lord and they said to Moses, why'd you bring us out to die in the wilderness? Weren't there enough graves for us in Egypt? What have you done to us? Why did you make us leave Egypt? You were nuts, we should never have followed you. Didn't, they, didn't you tell us this would happen when we were still in Egypt? We said, leave us alone, let us be slaves to the Egyptians. It's better to be a slave in, the, in Egypt than a corpse in the wilderness. They're panicked, man. They're like, this is, this is, this is nuts. Why did we ever leave our old slavery? And Moses responds, and I love this, it's so good. Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Just what? Stand still and watch the Lord rescue you. Who's gonna rescue them? The Lord. The Egyptians you see today will never be seen again. The Lord himself will what? Fight for you. Just stay calm. And this is what I, what, what, like, all of a sudden I realized, this is really important, man. Ever been panicked? Ever been feeling like, oh my gosh, I'm at the edge of this, and now, not only am I at the edge of this thing, but think evil things are charging at me. This is gonna really, really suck for me. At this moment, you don't need somebody else to speak fear at you, you need somebody to speak faith at you. Right. Right. Third thing heroes do, heroes speak faith while others speak fear. Heroes speak faith, others speak fear. Which are you? We can't possibly, we could never trust. It will never work out. We could never do that. Oh my gosh, it's too difficult. It's too hard. I'm gonna die. It's like, our, it's gonna fail. It's never gonna work. Fear, panic, discouragement. Heroes don't think like this. I have victory through the name of Jesus. 
I have power in the name of Jesus. I can trust the everlasting, the everlasting strength of my good God who holds me by his right hand and will never let me go. I will stand here in defiance, but I will not quit. I will not give up. My God will provide everything I need. I can trust him. He is good. I love him. He'll take good care of me. You need a friend like that. Do you have one? See, the only reason why I stay in this game is I have friends like that. I have people that when I start to crumble and I start to fear and I start to worry and I start to stress, they're whispering in my ear, no, no, no. You stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Yes. You don't give up. You don't lose hope. You don't, you don't give up on faith just because you don't see it right this second. God's gonna come through for you. Do you have a friend like this? Are you this kind of friend? You could be. This is what it means to get up from the chair in, some, in, any, in any, situ, any, any given situation when somebody's worried, stressed, depressed, confused, angry, bitter. Uh, like, this is the moment, man. No, no, no. God's got something better. God's got hope. God's got strength. God is with you. God is fighting for you. You're a victor and not a victim. Yes. Right? This is why we uh, relaunched our, our uh, discipleship groups this weekend. On the back of your chair, in Zerman, Big Lake too, we put this little card, can you get it out? This little white card. It's on the back of every chair. Everybody say, I don't wanna do life alone. Why don't you say something else too? I don't wanna listen to stupid people when I'm stressed. Right? Because the wrong influence, when you're already at the edge of the sea, is just going to cause you to drown. That's right. And that's why these things exist. These groups, men's groups, women's group, co-ed groups, uh, specialized uh, groups specifically for grief, like grief share, divorce care, uh, mothers of preschoolers, uh, recovery meetings, uh, student groups. All of these groups exist so that there's somebody to speak faith for you in your struggle. Here's my challenge to you. What if you chose one? What if you chose, all, all you have to do at the end of the service is tear off the bottom of this and like name, phone number, email, be very specific so we can actually read it. And the group that you're interested in. And that group leader will call you this week. They'll say, here's when we meet, here's what we're about, here's what's going on. And then you will have somebody in your life that knows your name, knows your struggle. And when you're feeling like giving up, somebody else is gonna whisper in your ear, no, 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 it's not time to quit yet. It's not time to quit yet. That's why these exist. Everybody say, be heroic. Be heroic. Speak faith. Speak faith. I'm gonna take it further, like in your home. Don't start stressing out and talking negative to your spouse. How's that gonna help the situation? How's it gonna help to speak? We're not gonna pay our bills. We're never gonna survive this. I'm never gonna get a job. I'm never gonna get past this. We're always gonna struggle. Yeah, you're right. Because <laughs> you just decided that's what's gonna happen. You, what you speak, you're gonna end up bringing about. But if you start speaking in faith, God, God's, gonna, God's got more for us, God's got a plan for us. We might be at the edge of this, we might see the Egyptians coming, but we are going to survive this because I am a victor in Christ and not a victim. That's right. Here we go, number four. Exodus chapter, let's just look down to verse 16. We'll just, we're gonna, we're gonna skip ahead. Exodus 14, 16. So God's talking to Moses now after the people panic and God, and, 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 and by the way, Moses could have been like, just chillax, what's wrong with you? Why are you whining? <laughs> right? Instead, he cared enough to speak faith to them. Think about that for a second. Sometimes like somebody starts whining, we start rolling our eyes. He doesn't roll his eyes. He, he, he speaks love and kindness over them. Come on, it's gonna be okay. I'm gonna take good care of you. He's a father figure to these people who are so hurting and so scared. And so God's like, okay, here's what we're gonna do. Here's what we're gonna do. This is Exodus 14, 16. Pick up your what? Yeah. And raise your hand over the sea. Divide the water so the Israelites walk through the middle of the sea on dry ground. And I was like, I don't have a staff, God. I don't have like a stick that I can like make obstacles go away. I've tried to beat obstacles away, but they don't seem to go. And then all of a sudden I realized I, I do. And so do you. I have a staff that when it is spoken, chains are broken, 
when, it is, when, when, when this word is spoken, captives are set free. When this person's name is shouted on my lips, when this person's name is in my head, when I am bowing in this person's name, you know what? Obstacles run away like the Red Sea. Whose name am I talking about here? Jesus. Whose name? Jesus. Yeah, you have a staff. His name is Jesus. You have a staff. You're equipped with everything you need to conquer every obstacle you face. His name is Jesus. Woo! At the name of Jesus, addictions are broken. You can get free. At the name of Jesus, marriages get restored. You get free. At the name of Jesus, anything that you face can be conquered because you trust in his name and his name alone. Yes. How do we know this? How do we know this? I'll give you two verses. By the way, number four was, heroes push back obstacles in the name of Jesus, if you didn't know that. Philippians chapter two, verse 10 says this, at the name of Jesus, every knee would what? How many, how many knees? Every. every knee, every obstacle you face. Every struggle you come up against. Sickness, lack, confusion, depression, despair, discouragement, addiction, pain, struggle, everything bows to the name of Jesus. How do you bring the name of Jesus to your struggle, to your obstacle, to your situation? Well, this is what Mark, Mark chapter 11, verse 23 says. It says, if anyone, what's the next word? Yes. Says to this mountain, go away. Throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what they, what's the next word? Say, say will happen, it will be done. done. You start speaking the name of Jesus at your situation. And you start speaking the name of Jesus over your struggle. Like, you know what? This addiction is not going to get me anymore. Why? Because I am controlled by the blood of Jesus. He owns me. He controls me. He rules me. He reigns in me. Jesus Christ owned me. I'm not going back there. And demons flee. And obstacles tremble. And waters part. Some of you facing lack or facing uh, the sickness. And like, come on, man. Speak Jesus at this. Think Jesus at this. Everything you face is conquered in the name of Jesus and nothing is conquered in our own strength, in our own way. Your marriage struggle? Yeah, Jesus defeats this. If you figure out what does he want me to do in this situation? In the, what does the name of Christ want from me in this moment, with this situation, with this woman, in this time? When that becomes our everything, Waters part. Is this good news? Yes. Yeah. We don't just say, hey, we're victors and not victims because of us. We're victors and not victims because of Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why the song we just sang, right? I was very specific with It Is Finished right before I preached this weekend. There's power in the name of, healing in the name of, always in the name of. It is all we got. It's the name of Jesus that wins, that satisfies, that overcomes, that controls, that conquers, that rules. How do you need to bring Jesus to your situation? It's your answer. On uh, Thursday, we were at the marriage retreat and Kelly had a fever. And we hardly, we hardly ever get sick in Jesus' name. <laughs> and she had a fever. And so I just said, we'll go stand in the front of the mirror and tell, tell it to go away in the name of Jesus. So she's standing in front of the mirror. She's like, what? I'm going to stand in front of the mirror and tell the mirror, tell it to go away in the name of Jesus. She's looking at the mirror. And she, says, she says, go away, fever, in the name of Jesus. <laughs> and she's like, that sounds silly. That's just stupid. Like, that's, this isn't like, no, no, no. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. In the morning, she's fine. I'm not making it up. She's healed. She's whole. Like, the next day, like, bam, gone. Like, back to normal. Went about her business. We've been teaching our kids this since little. It's the name of Jesus that conquers stuff. When you're sick, when you're in pain, when you're discouraged, tell it to go away in the name of Jesus. It's Jesus that conquers our situations, our struggles, and our, pro our issues. If Jesus is not brought to our situation, we will live with our situation forever. Right. It's always, only Jesus. You have a staff given to you at the cross. It's Jesus' name. Is this good news, church? Yes. Yeah, it's such good news. We're almost done. Exodus 14, 21 says this. Then, this is, we're gonna jump to verse 21. Then, so Moses is gonna obey now. He says, then Moses what? 
He raised his hand over the sea, and the Lord opened up a? So he raised his hand and opened up his path. And I opened up a path. And then you can read the rest of it. Like, okay, the water's part, and they kind of went through, and they're like, yay, and the water's on both sides. And they're like, woo, we're making it through. Anyway, so here's the thing. I noticed the word, I noticed the word he raised his hand, and, and I noticed the word path, and all of a sudden it got me thinking. So Moses is like standing at the edge of the sea. He's like, by the way, if you look at the movie, he throws a sword. It was really funny. It was kind of, it was goofy. Um, anyway, so he's standing at the edge of the sea, and he's like, okay, God, you told me that this is supposed to go. So he looks at the people like, hey, we're going to go this way. <laughs> And they're like, it's water over there. <laughs> we are not mermaids. <laughs> no, 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 we're going this way. And he, like, I have this vision of him looking at them and pointing this way. And all of a sudden he looks back and goes, wait, where did that land come from? And all of a sudden the path is cleared. And I think he's as surprised as they are. Yeah. Because he didn't know what was going to happen. Right. God just said, take your stick, go stand over the water. Like, all right. Here we go, look that, that way, because I, I don't know why. <laughs> and all of a sudden it hit me, this is, this, is what you, this is the role you and I play in the world with every life we come in contact with. Heroes point the way and clear a path for others to meet Jesus. This is the role every Jesus follower plays. We point the way, hey, he's this way, he's this way, he's this way, he loves you, he's got a plan, he died for you, he's got a future for you, he's got a hope for you, he's this way. And there's this path. What if you tried that one instead of the path you're on? What if, what if, you, what if I know this one was confusing, and like, the, the, what, if, what if we tried this path? What if, we, what, if we, what if you cleared the path for somebody else? Heroes point the way and clear a path for others to meet him. I'm gonna talk about this for a second. I'm gonna talk about point the way for just a second. This is verse that popped in my brain when I thought of it. This is 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, or verse 3, or verse 2, it says this. For I determined, this is Paul talking, for I determined to know, to, to, to not know anything among you, except what? About what, except what? Jesus, Jesus Christ and him Crucified. People ask me all the time, like we were in the marriage retreat, people ask me all kinds of questions. How do I solve this marriage issue? How do I fix this struggle? What do we do about this situation? And I'm like, I don't really know anything except Jesus. So what would we bring Jesus to that? And all of a sudden, healing started happening to situation after situation after situation on this retreat. Because the only thing I know to fix any problem I've ever faced is, well, the only thing I know to look at or to point to is Jesus. Your struggle is solved in Jesus' name. What does Jesus have for you in relationship to this issue? Find out, he's got something more for you. It's Jesus you're looking for. He loves you, he died for you. He's standing there with open arms, with nails booted through both hands going, I died for all your stuff, I am pointing the way to something better. Just follow me. This is what not just pastors do, this is what every Jesus follower does. We point the way to the only one with answers. I love that Paul humbly goes, I don't really know much, but I know Jesus, and he seems to do the job, so okay. <laughs> Imagine for a second a world where everybody answered with, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. With, I'm gonna turn the other cheek. Blessed are those who persecute me because I'm going to inherit the earth. Imagine for a second that we were going, I'm not going to give up on you because Jesus doesn't give up on me. I'm not going to forget about you because Jesus doesn't forget about me. I'm not going to abandon you or discourage you or speak negative over you because he never speaks this way over me. What if all we ever did was point to Jesus? Don't you think the world could get better? See, even people who don't believe know that that guy was pretty good. And it wouldn't hurt for everybody to be a little more Jesus-y <laughs> in some of those kind of ways. Right? We point the way. Everybody say point the way. Amen. We also clear a path. And I was thinking about clear a path because um, the, the, the Red Sea parts and the path is cleared and <laughs> they go through the other side. And it got me thinking about, about, about linebackers because it's the Super Bowl this weekend. So um, this coming weekend, Super Bowl, like, like we're just seven days away and like I, I really want the Patriots to lose yeah! in the name of Jesus. <laughs> um, I, 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 I'm not partial to that. So, um, 
to that whole deal. We're, I'm, I'm kind of done with that. Um, anyhow, I got to thinking about football, and I'm thinking about like, okay, you have this offensive line that when they hand the ball to a running back, it is this line's job to clear a path. So suddenly, a couple of them go this way, a couple of them go this way, and a path opens up, and this running back, right through the center. Do you know that is your job with every person you come in contact with? It is to clear a path so they can actually see the real Jesus. It is to help, help, help them with their doubts and with their discouragements. And like they, they've heard negative things about church and about people and about uh, uh, like this situation or that situation. And they're like, man, it's like, like I, I, Christians are such jerks and they're such, like, and we are the ones that get to clear the way. We're like, no, no, that's not who Jesus is. I'll be honest with you. Sometimes I'm a screw up, but Jesus isn't a screw up. And I get to point though, I get to clear a path so they actually see a real loving, gentle, strong God who pays attention to their every need, whose hand of favor wants to fall on them. This is your role. When somebody says, I'm not sure, what about this? This is bothering me about that. Heroic people are like the front line, man. We're gonna push over the obstacles so they can see Jesus. Does this make sense? Yeah. This is how we get up out of the seat. We just point the way and clear a path. We just point the way, like, uh, that's really all God asks, because it's about Jesus. Everything's about Jesus, man. Like somebody one time said, um, and I heard those are so good, they said, the story of the world is really the story of Christ's life and everybody else is just a background character. That's me, I, I, I am not a main character in my own life. Jesus is my main character and I'm in the background, I'm a bit player to the Jesus story and I'm just trying to get, like if, if a background character of a movie is like, whoa, look at me, don't look at Brad Pitt. <laughs> what happens to that guy? Gone. <laughs> Cause the girl wants to look at Brad Pitt. <laughs> not always. <laughs> but truthfully, this is how life works for Christians. We're trying to become background characters for Jesus' story. Just look at Jesus, follow Jesus, trust Jesus. I wanna get out of the way so you can see this beautiful, amazing, wonderful person who died for you and has a plan for you, is gonna be good to you. Just trust this one, it's always his story. Point the way to clear a path. Point the way, clear a path. And I don't do this a lot, but I'm gonna actually ask you to do that for us this week. I'm asking you at the Crossing Church in this service, Elk River, Zimmerman, Big Lake, to clear a path and point the way for somebody. What do you, what do you mean? Um, next week is our Super Bowl party, all weekend long. Super Bowl weekend at the Crossing Church. We've got, we're pitting chicken noodle soup versus tomato soup, which is, at the end of the day, I don't really care about that at all. Um, but we have two former Vikings players coming next week to share their, their faith stories. They're gonna talk about giving their life to Christ and what this means and what this is about and like uh, uh, why they trusted Christ. And Kelly and I are gonna interview them both Saturday and Sunday, two, one guy on Saturday night, one, one guy Sunday morning. And um, at the campuses, they're gonna give away signed footballs to anybody who, who comes as a first time with, as a guest. And so what we are asking you to do is this week to decide not not to invite somebody, but to bring somebody. You know the difference? Yeah. Inviting is what, what like, I think all of you are awesome at. You're like, yeah, I wanna invite somebody to church. Let's be cool if they heard about how great Jesus is and how good Jesus is. And we're great at inviting. I, I'm asking you to take it a step further and actually bring someone. Be the front line for somebody else's life. <clears throat> You're gonna go to war on their behalf so we can tackle objections and discouragement and disappointment and pain and we're gonna get out of the way, we're gonna clear a path so they can get directly to Jesus. And so what I'm asking all of you to do at every campus is next week, please don't come alone. This is a perfect opportunity for somebody else who doesn't know Christ to hear that God is good and he loves them and he's got a plan for them and he can be good to them. This is an opportunity for you to get up out of this chair and say, I'm actually gonna do the hard stuff God's called me to do. Why? Because like, when you do the hard stuff, this is where the miracles are. Yeah. 
You know how fishing works, right? The guy who keeps the line in the water always catches the most fish. And the other people complain, I never catch any fish. How come I never catch any fish? Because you ain't fishing. You're talking, you're drinking beer, (laughs) you're doing other stuff, but you ain't really fishing. I catch more fish than most people except Pastor Jason. We kind of rival. (laughs) Because our lines are just in the water and in the water and in the water and in the water and we catch fish. Same is true spiritually. I catch a lot of fish because I've made it my goal to fish. So what if you got out of the chair? What could happen? What could occur? What could, if next weekend, this place saw this kind of result? Well, what kind of result? Well, this is Exodus 14, 31. This is the last, this is the last verse in this chapter. And notice what this chapter, this, this last verse is about. It wasn't ever about the Red Sea. It wasn't ever about Egyptians. It wasn't ever even, even, even really about Moses. When the people of Israel saw the mighty power that the had unleashed against the Egyptians, they were filled with awe before him. They put their in the and in his servant Moses. Notice that the story really was about putting your faith in the Lord. All of this, heroism for a Christian is never about anything except helping somebody else put their faith in the Lord. And the only way somebody else puts their faith in the Lord is you decide, I'm going to put my faith in him. Which leads me to my last thought, and that's just this. Heroes get to be part of somebody else's miracle. Heroes get to be part of somebody else's miracle. This kind of life, this kind of thought process, this kind of thinking, this kind of focus, this kind of passion, you, you will, it is guaranteed, you will be part of somebody else's miracle at some time if you just keep fishing and you focus on faith, you focus on Christ, you, you step when he asks you to step, the result is you will see other people put their faith in the Lord. Crossing Church, will you do this? I'm going to pray for you, but my prayer is that you never do this in your own strength. You do this empowered by the Spirit of God, and in the strength of God, and in the mind of God, and the love of God, because that's what's in you. We're going to see God do great things. We're going to see God do great things. We're going to see God do great things. You're going to see God do great things. It's going to happen. Why? Because we worship a great God. Jesus, I thank you. I bless your name. Right now, in the name of Jesus, I command demons to flee. Not because I'm great, but because your name is great. The blood of Jesus covers our sin. I pray for those who know they need to make heroic decisions that they do the hard stuff of forgiveness and commitment and whatever that looks like in their situation and their struggle. May they follow through, but may they do so in the name of Jesus, in the power of Jesus, in the wisdom of Jesus and the love of Christ. May people walk out of here so focused on you, Christ, so filled up, so impassioned, so strengthened, so bold that they cannot fail because they are in you. And then next weekend, God, I pray that as we seek to reach people, we're going to get up out of the chair. We're going to be uncomfortable so somebody else can be comforted. God, I pray that you would cause people to put their faith in the Lord. May we be the people you've called us to be. May we be heroic. May we be heroic. May we be heroic. We thank you, Jesus. Amen.